It's the Zach Sang Zach Sang Show. Show. Zach Sang Show. Hello. Hello. Hey. What's going on? Hello. Hey. Hey, how are you doing? I'm Zach. Zach. Hey, Ryan. Nice to meet you. Hey. Hi there. Nice to meet you. Hey. Hey, Dan. Hey, how you doing? Zach Sang Show. Ryan Tedder in the studio, everybody. Ooh, thank you. Right. An honor to have you here, sir. Thanks for having me. One Republic, wherever I go, that is the current single. How you feel? Feeling good. I'm tired. I just got back from, uh, I was in Japan and Australia, the Philippines. Then I flew to Mexico City, shot a music video. We're shooting, we're kind of knocking out all our music videos, like in one fell swoop. We know wow. kind of what the first four singles are. We just don't know. We're terrible at picking the order. So okay. we're just knocking the videos out. And getting that done. So I came from Tokyo to Mexico City to a wedding in Pittsburgh to now I'm here. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Fourth so, album. Do you even have a release on it yet? We do. We have we have the release date. I think we're 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 gonna announce it really soon. It's definitely um early autumn. Okay. Yeah. Is there it's a sh- coming soon. Do you have like a formula or a strategy when you're launching an album now that you, you you've ha- you, you're about to have four of them, or is it always different? Um, it's always different. I think the uh, the idea, uh, you know, formula wise, I think on on this album we're definitely making more of a to do out of it because because we can, I guess, and because it's time, and we're really excited about it. So we're we've spent a way a lot more time on the launch the launch of the album. We have a lot of crazy things coming up that we're going to do surrounding it and cool. uh, very new technology driven uh, things that are like going to be immersive. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And well, um, and then the only other strategy is uh, I was making a joke about this uh, on Twitter the other day. We never we never um, we, we're the, my least favorite thing is picking a first single because I never know you're so deep down in the trenches. Yeah. I never have the objectivity. So I'm I'm so excited uh, the, the new formula that we're going to try and approach is just get a lot more songs out quicker. Okay. And then literally, you know, we, with with streaming and, and iTunes and just online social media at this point, it's kind of like the world's going to pick what, what their favorite record is anyway. That's it. It's yeah. a different game. It's a different game. Society is the judge and you have to release That's everything. It. You kind of have to just put yeah. it out there. Yeah. Because to see where it goes, I mean, streaming, the, of course, the, everything counts. Everything's going to streaming now. I mean, we were in Europe and in... I don't think we were in a single country where where iTunes or sales uh, led streaming. Streaming is everything. Wow. It's every, and what's cool is, uh, I love streaming. And uh, what's amazing is it opens you up to such a bigger audience. I mean, radio is still the number one. Um, it is number one access supplier of music. I don't know the term disseminator of music. That's correct. There you go uh, in the world. But for people who then go, I like that song. I want to hear it more. It's streaming. That's it. Everywhere. It really is the future. I, Apple is. Music, man. $10 yeah. a month. Like, Dude, that's I have it. everything. That's it. And the, the cool thing is, like, uh, what's great about streaming is it helps artists in terms of touring because, so let's say you hear Wherever I Go, or you heard Counting Stars, or Lovern's Out, and you, you go, oh, I like that song, I want to go hear that song. And then then Apple Music or Spotify immediately points you to, oh, they did Good Life? Yeah. They did Secrets? They did Apologize? Like, uh, there are people who literally just go, I had no idea you did Stop and Stare, it's, or whatever the song is. They, and, and it redirects you to all that. Whereas it's literally like it. Netflix almost, right? Yes, Giving yeah. artists a new, exactly a new breath of life. It's Netflix. Yeah. It's Netflix. And it, and, and it points... If you have a history of of albums that have songs that people loved on them, uh, and you're an act like us, which we've never been the huge kind of fireworks, flash, boom, bang uh, band, so there's a lot of, we still find people, you know, here we are nine years in, we'll still find people, like I said, that go, oh my God, you you did those. Like, I like the new record. I didn't know you did that one. Like, yeah. And streaming does that. It does it so quickly, just like Netflix. Now, you started as a writer, right? Like, I mean, you started a band. Yeah, you I, started st- One Republic. I started as a solo artist. Yeah. Uh, before One Republic, I was a solo artist, and it co- I, was, I was a teenager, and it coincided with John Mayer, Timberlake, I, every white dude that could sing <laughs> or play a guitar and or slash play guitars. They're all there. They all blew up, yeah. and literally at the time, I was like, I had kind of mastered the guitar for what I needed to play. I was doing. People ask, what, what was the stuff you like? Solo artist version of you. I was doing at the time uh, when Ed Sheeran came out. Oh. I thought that's the closest proximity to the kind of music I was doing. It's, it was very much of that sound, like, but you know, early two thousands. Yeah, and I just got spooked out by all the like. Imagine three Ed Sheerans coming out at the same time. And he's like, all right, the last thing I want to do at that point is pick up a guitar and be like, hey, I'm another white guy with a guitar. <laughs> so I was like, let's start a band. You know, I, I loved Oasis. I loved U2. I loved, um, you know, I, I worshipped 
all these incredible bands of the 90s and uh you know third eye blind i mean it's yeah. you name it i loved bands so i started a band and that was kind of my direct response to not wanting to be another white guy with a guitar <laughs> There's strategy involved there. There's strategy. Has there been strategy? That, that, because you've been making music for a very long time. Yes. Have you been thinking like that? You, not Maybe not since the beginning, but, I mean, decades now. Strategery. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've, been, uh, I've been... You have to be somewhat of a strategist. I think, uh, for me, the strategy, when it comes to music or a career in any field, whether you're an actor or you're uh -huh. an insurance salesman or a DJ, um, you kind of think, well, I love to do this. I would like to eliminate any things that would keep me from doing this in the future because I love my job. Yeah. So I, I'd rather, rather than leave everything up to chance, I'd rather be more strategic in how we put things out and how we roll things out. I mean, you have an artist, this is an extreme example, but Taylor, incredible, yeah. incredibly strategic. Every, it, everything, every, every move single move is thought out. From the pizza party to the shirt. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. And, and a lot of artists, if you care, if you care, then you don't just care about having a song you care about all the details and everything mm -hmm. surrounding it and it can become all consuming you can you can get a little kanye on it where it's it's you go so deep that you you almost lose your mind trying to control all the different spinning mm -hmm. plates but um for us uh you know we've been very fortunate in the past ever you know uh, for come hell or high water we've always found a way of connecting with an audience and i think this album I mean, I'm very biased because I'm in the band, but this is the best album I think that we've that we've ever made. So we want to be strategic about it. And that's an amazing statement when you look back at your history as a band. I mean, you have some of the the, the highest selling singles of all time. Yeah, you guys paved the way for digital downloads really back in the yeah, day. Yeah, massive. Yeah, immersive. What do you mean by that exactly? Immersive. Um, well, let's just say that I got inspired. Um, five years ago by um, uh, when Arcade Fire launched it's two albums ago they launched that thing that 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 where you could uh, be leading up to their album release I kind of set that as the benchmark they launched this thing where you type in your home address and this music would play and then a video of this guy running and he would run literally from this magical place and end up using Google Maps. They did a deal with Google Maps where they would he would run up to your childhood home. That's awesome. And in the, be, between the music playing in the background, which is one of the wasn't even a single, it was just an arcade fire song, but very yeah. emotional song playing with all of a sudden you're going, Where what's happening? You see birds flying and trees moving and all of a sudden you go, Oh my God, it's my childhood home. And I watched I watched dozens of people watch this um album launch event thing for like That's a cool. month or two and people I watched my mom cry like like I watched I watched my uh, sister-in-law cry I watched people get really emotional yeah. and I thought this is the single coolest album launch thing Easy. I've ever seen it was immersive so I, we're not doing that but yeah. I'll just say it started with that I saw that and I said how can we people have phones everybody has a computer in their pocket right now mm -hmm. um, you've got VR technology has yeah. exploded um, how can we do something that makes people feel something? That's the goal, to make people feel something. Wow. This is like, I, when, when you're listening to other people's music or you're experiencing somebody's album release, what goes to your mind? Do you experience that as, as a consumer and then analyze it? Or are you analyzing right out the gate? Because I, I experience it in both. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very much right and left brained, extreme right, extreme left. So I kind of flip back and forth between the two. When I'm writing music, if I'm writing a song at all, it's 100% right brain. I can't even handle left brain conversations or, or people being too analytic or too yeah. whatever. It literally just sets me off the rails. I'm fully immersed in the creative process. The moment that door closes, uh, the left brain opens and it becomes analytic and it becomes more strategery. You know, um, awesome. so yeah, then I start looking at everything, uh, from a different lens. So if so someone's launching an album, I mean, the first thing I look at is artwork. Uh, yeah. obviously that's the first thing you see. And, um, and then just kind of like anybody else, uh, you know, the first single is kind of a tell that is. to some degree. Uh, but it can also be a bait and switch. I mean, it's so hard to say. It's like, um, I mentioned Ed a minute ago, but like if you, if you heard, what was the first single dance or sing or something like that uh don't wait uh, what, or from a? yeah from a, yeah yeah i think it was sing so 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 if you made a judgment call on yeah. his album based on that record you'd be dead wrong literally didn't sound like any other song no. on the album it's kind of like sugar ray like 
fly or whatever that's i just want to fly <laughs> and famously that was the only song on the album that was a single or every the rest of the record was a punk record yeah, you know yeah. what i mean so then he has this one pop record so so you can't judge a book by its cover but everybody they do they do uh-huh. but the thing is now because of streaming again tying it back in i mean you look at uh drake over the last 12 months um you know you can name two songs right you can name uh one dance yes and you can name um uh, Hotline Bling, right? Yeah. That was last summer, okay? There's four other songs that came out in between now and then. Name one. I don't. Exactly. I, I, so the, You know? I mean, he's also been featured on a million, but yeah, those yes. are the two that come to your mind. Yeah, yeah. right? So the point, the point is you, it's a different era. It's like consumption. You people, you, all that matters is like if you have, if you've established a brand as who you are as an artist or as a band and, and you care about what you do and you're, you're telling true story, you're being as honest as possible as an artist, then it, in this day and age, just get music out there. Get it out. Get you know, people people want something, they want to hear from you pretty much at all times. I mean, we're all kind of addicted to new information now and, and culture and you know, I mean I'm online just like everybody else. So you just want something new. So I think the most important thing now is like you get you get new stuff out there and then again you let the world decide. It, 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 it is. It's often though. I mean, I was just talking about it yesterday. I mean, the cycle of music. It's rapid. It's crazy. We consume really fast. Yes, we're. Con- I mean, the, the the term I've heard so much in the last six months, more than any other term, uh, is consumption. Yeah. Like the the new model of music is consumption, and it's it's more about uh, if. As long as you don't, I mean, look, if it sucks, it sucks. Don't put out something that sucks. Yeah. Rule number one, if it sucks, don't put it out. Um, but rule number two, uh, put something out. Like, like get out new material. If you are if you have your own kind of quality control as far as music's concerned, because yeah. it's art, it's, you can't really judge it on a scale. It's, yeah. it, yesterday this song did not exist. Now it exists. Like, that's very weird. You know what I mean? Uh. And you're not selling you're not selling like uh, envelopes and gears. You're selling something that that, that you can't even really touch. No. You know, so it's this this uh, untouchable art form. It's really bizarre. Um, and, and what people what people want because of the way we consume stuff. And like, I'll get on Twitter and see a fan being like, um, my my Spotify playlist or my my iTunes says I've listened to this song already forty times today. I'm like, God, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> like, we it, it, our song's been out. Six weeks, and we now have people literally on Twitter yelling at us to put out a, n- a new song. They're like, "When's the second single? What's the name? What's the name?" You know, just like, "Are you going to tell?" And you're like, "I'm not going to. I'm not going to eat until you tell me the name of the second single." I'm just like, "I'm like, it's been six weeks." But, but does it hurt a little bit? Because it, it must be harder to create a timeless record then. Because if you're always producing yeah. and you're keeping up with demand, does yeah. a timeless record? Do we give Time- any one song the, the respect it deserves? Timeless records don't. I just had a conversation on NPR, okay. and the guy literally asked me, "Are we in an era where it is impossible to make a timeless record?" Literally ten minutes uh. ago, and I said, "Um, I mean, he said he made some comment like uh, Etta James, you can put on right now, still sounds amazing. You know that that one." Um, there are still modern classics. Yeah. I would say there are fewer and f- fewer and f- further between. Yeah. In recent memory, um, obviously Adele. Uh, you know, uh, there's but it's it hits uh, having a huge hit smash. Whatever, blah blah blah. Fill in the blank. Record does not equal a classic record. No. whatsoever. And it mean and it. I think they're even. I don't want to say music is less classic now than ever, but I would say the whole turn and burn mentality and the whole get something new out in yeah. production and the sound of, of music and radio shifting every three to six months it doesn't lend itself very well to making classic record that said the people that can ignore that stuff and just honestly write I sound cheesy but write from the heart still can cut through I mean the James Bay record has a classic sound to it I get that the Adele I would say that uh, you know um uh, rehab, you know, Amy Winehouse to me is a classic sounding yes. record. And in the in the last four years, I think, I mean, I might get crucified for this, but like the most the most modern classic sounding record to me of the last three years would be probably Stay with Me, okay. Sam Smith, and then yeah. and then you know Hosier Take Me to Church is up there, but Stay with Me is you know that that one I think will stand the test of time. Yeah. Um, you can't predict what but, songs are going to be played 10 years from now. But you also can't put a definition on it. No, that. you can't. Because would you have said play that funky music as a white boy is a classic no. record? No, but it is. No. But, and, and I would include apologize on that apologize, list. Apologize, yeah. We we saw this metric, this this whole study that was done by, by like 
not MIT, but like literally university on songs. Yeah. And they uh, randomly, I got all these people forwarded it to me um, like six months ago, Counting Stars. They've, they've, they charted classic songs of the last 70s, 80s, and 90s. Yeah. And all the um, scale of airplay sales and all these other, like, literally it looked like reading Japanese. Yeah. I didn't understand it, but it was a scientific breakdown. Okay. And they predicted, they were like, the, in the last two years, the song that matches this, correlates to this uh, most closely is count, is One Republic's Counting Stars. I was like, you've got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> but, and I don't know if that will happen. But the, the, point, the point is, the number one rule for a, a classic record, in my opinion, yeah. is one that doesn't burn. That is the most important. Now, look, there's 20 other things that could yeah. define what a classic record is, but the most important thing is you have a record that doesn't burn. Yeah. It doesn't wear people out, um, or it wears it wears them out a lot less than all the surrounding music. Yeah. And that Stay With Me, to me, checks that box. How, how does it feel for you when you read an article like that and it says, you know, counting stars? Yeah. Going to be a timeless record. I kind of free... I did be, to be honest, of all, there's all kinds of stats and everything, and, uh, you know, you can... It's easy to get caught up in stats. They're interesting yeah. for talking points, but um, I don't really get too excited about much because I'm, I'm very, I'm not a superstitious person. I'm superstitious about being high on yourself. Okay. Uh, like if the moment the moment you stop to like pop champagne and congratulate yourself on yet another victory or this that or the other, that's the moment that literally like in a, in a if you're on, you know, it's not a race, but if you're if you're like on a racetrack that's the moment the other cars go vroom, yeah. you know what I mean and you're like you can't it's not about winning it's it's about the process you have to love you have to love the process and that's what um, I think my favorite artists you know they focus on the process you know and Woody Allen's a very controversial person I don't you know, obviously, I'm not, I'm not big up on everything he does. But yeah. the one thing that he did say in an interview that I liked, that I liked a lot, they're like, "You're so prolific, man. How do you, you know, how do you do that? How do you do so many movies? And and um, don't you get caught up when one doesn't work?" And he said, "Never. The moment I wrap a movie, the moment we literally hit, and that's a wrap, and it's done and edited." I've already started the next script. That way, I never get caught up in the ones that don't work because if you're a creator inevitably not you're going to swing and miss yeah. so if you get too caught up emotionally in that stuff you'll you'll crater everything you have to just start the next script start the next song so that's kind of what i focus on wow yeah, the counting stars the, the article on counting stars was one of the few moments i got excited i like emailed my manager I was like did you see this article he's like everyone saw the article they, everyone f- sent me the article and uh it's cool yeah it's cool it's fun it's fun yeah it, it's a testament you know i yeah. mean there, there must be mo- a lot of, you know it's interesting your race car analogy you, you know you pretty much describe the entire music industry yeah every other day is an opportunity to stop and celebrate myself and pop a bottle of champagne 100 percent. do you hate that um i don't hate it i just don't uh i don't buy i don't subscribe to it i think i love i love the work I love winning as much as anybody else. Yeah. Look, I played. I was. I played like five sports growing up. I was in every single uh, team you could imagine. So the the instinct to win is obviously resides within me. Yeah. But it, if you in this line of work in music, it, it's it gets really yucky when it becomes about winning. Then it's not about the art. It's yeah. not about creating, and ultimately it's about connecting. So my my. My goal when we started One Republic, I wanted to play arenas every city in the world. That was the only goal I had. Very simple. I know it's a very big goal, but the goal was I want to play for between ten and 20,000 people in every major city on earth. Like I want to go to Cairo. I want to see 15,000 people there. I want to go to Sydney, et cetera. And so that, that was the goal for me. And anything that came above and beyond that was icing on the cake. So it wasn't about, there will always be bands that have more number ones than us. There will always be uh, some writer that writes more hits than I do. And if you get caught up in that business, that's just noise. Like you can't, you can't, you can't focus on that. You have, you have to love the process. Yeah. You have to be pushing yourself and be doing something different and not just copying, you know. Uh, yeah, that's it. I, th- you keep your nose down, keep working. Don't drink too much champagne. <laughs> By the way, champagne gives wicked hangovers. Yes, it does. <laughs> it is the bad. worst hangover yeah. maybe ever. It's like yeah. a 48-hour hangover guaranteed. It is guaranteed. It's the sickest I've, yeah. I think I've ever been was was off champagne. Really? See, I properly hydrate <clears throat> myself. I don't... I'm like re- you're yeah. lucky. Are you straight edge? Well, like not real. No, I mean I smoke some weed. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know? for sure. See, I can't yeah. smoke weed. 
Really? Yeah, I tried it. I had uh, both, you know, edible and 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 what we were in Amsterdam. You yeah. know, this is before oh, it was you before it was legal. Yeah. I, you know, I have a place in Colorado and yeah. in, in California. And it's legal in Colorado, but I was never. I didn't. I wasn't raised around weed. I, I didn't. Um, it just wasn't a thing where yeah. I'm from. And uh, you know, where I'm from in Oklahoma, it's like Milwaukee's best and cheap beer. That's that. That's the <laughs> thing Beast. there. Yeah. So I uh, wasn't around it, but we were on tour in in Holland, and um, you know, it's legal. It's yeah. everywhere. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll try it. Horrible, <laughs> horrible. <laughs> I mean, inside of five minutes, instant cotton mouth, splitting migraine, oh. sick. I was awake for five hours straight in bed, sweating. I I looked over when I finally woke up at noon the next day, oh. and I had seven bottles of of bottled water next to my bed. Seven, mm-hmm. because at the moment I take a sip of water, my entire mouth would dry up. You know, my <laughs> eyes were bright, bright red, and so I I told a, a buddy of mine. Uh, that I went to high school with owns yeah. the, owns the biggest dispensary in Colorado. Like he's he's crushing That's it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and they, we, we graduated from a Christian high school, <laughs> and he goes on to open the biggest weed dispensary. And it's, killing it's it. It's so funny. Yeah. He's killing it. Um, but he uh, we we were all at this uh, event together one night. I hadn't seen him in years, uh-huh. and he was asked. So I'm telling he, he's big on the medicinal purposes of yes. weed. Um, uh, and he created something called Charlotte's Web, which helps. Uh, Are you that changed? I mean, yeah. that saved so many children. Yeah, that's that's the guy I went to high school with. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's it, it, uh, an historic strain of weed that mm-hmm. set a whole mm-hmm. precedent yeah. into action. Yeah. Beautiful. It's saving kids' lives uh, yeah. with epilepsy and seizures. And, oh, it's amazing. And literally changing their lives. And um, he's having to fight through all this governmental red tape to get it out there because people think you're going to get high off of it, but it's not. No. It's distilled down to one of the elements of, of marijuana that keeps kids from having seizures. CBD. Yeah. So so him and his brother uh, invented it. They literally wow. uh, f- isolated it, extracted it, and they, they, you know, they've been on... Uh, you know, I think the View and the Today Show, a handful of shows that he's he's gone around, talked about. So he knows a lot. Needless to say, he knows a lot about weed. Yeah, and we were hanging out one night, and, uh, and now we're on a whole weed conversation. And I was I talking, I was talking to him, and um, he was like, "So, do you, uh, you know, do you smoke?" I was like, "No, I don't." Um, hey, and I'm a singer, so it's not exactly yeah. great. Um, and uh, and I, I said, I can't. I, I I did my one my one test, both you know, edible and and, and <laughs> failed. Smoking and I failed miserably. He said, "What were, what did you feel like?" And I described my symptoms, and he's like, "Yeah, one out of ten people have um, their body produces already a, an excessive uh, amount of one of the compounds found in weed, and if it interacts with, if you introduce um, that that chemical or whatever to your body, it's the equivalent of of a positive and a positive on side of a magnet. You know how when you try to push two magnets yeah. together, it's like that's what happens." And he said. He said, funny enough, I I own this dispensary and I can't smoke weed. He's like, I have that, I have the exact same issue. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So I, I cannot touch the stuff. Yeah, but you know, do you social, like you have two kids, you yeah. have a wife, like you have a beautiful life now. You're, 100%. you're an adult. You of are, course. Do, do you go out often? <laughs> By the way, do you, do you party? <laughs> what I'm asking is. Um. That was uh, beautiful, by the way. I could, yeah. Man, there's I, something there. I took a radio course at college. That's not, I mean, <laughs> come on. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we, uh, coming up next, we got 60 minutes of commercial free music only here. You need to send that to Ryan Seacrest. I heard a little Ryan in that. That was good. Yeah, Ryan's got a little bit of that bright, happy. Yeah, I just woke up in Los Angeles. We're hanging out today with uh, the Kardashians. Da 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 da. Wow. Yeah, I, can, I can do it. You like That's it? Good. Well, superb. All right, maybe I can intern for you. Yeah, yeah you, you, you're welcome here whenever you I need. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I only play old Britney Spears, but. That, that's totally fine. Okay, with cool, me. cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so I go out. Uh, the, th- the thing is, I'm a, I am I'm still a social animal. I, yeah. I, I love. I, you kind of have to turn me off. Um, I'm like an Energizer bunny. Like so, when we go out and we do promo and tours and stuff, you know the the dinners with the record labels and meeting all the people and yeah. all that stuff. I can do that. I can outlast anybody. I can hang till three in the morning and people are like, "How are you still standing? You wow. just did a concert, you know?" <laughs> so I have to kind of like put like stops on myself and be like it's time to go time to go to bed stop talking so i love socializing i love going out um i do not like getting drunk uh uh (laughs) i do not like being high that said i do enjoy drinking so you you get very (laughs) you get you become a professional at knowing you kind of just and when you're in a band and you've toured as long as i have You've been around it. It's, yeah. I understand why bands break up and why they develop dependency problems. I, I get it. Because imagine 
you're in the middle of uh, it's it's January and you're in the the middle of Holland mm-hmm. somewhere and it's gray and it's freezing and you're at a venue parked in a parking lot with nothing surrounding you right in the back of an arena yeah. and you have unlimited alcohol just sitting there and you've got like crap Wi-Fi like so what do you get you know what I mean you're, you're trying drink. to what else is there to you, do well you know an idle mind is the devil's workshop you yeah. have to figure out things on the road as dudes to fulfill fill the time and yeah. so that's where drinking excessively kicks in or drug usage it's not because you're just these deviant miscreants and yeah. you're evil it's because you literally have you have two hours total of work in a 24 hour day right so for the other uh, 14 hours that you're awake what are you going to do so at a certain point you've read all the books you've watched the Netflix series you've filled it all up yeah. so I'm lucky because I, I, I'm obsessed with songwriting so I write incessantly without ceasing and that that preoccupies my brain and it keeps me active and then I go for these long runs I, I try to get away from the venue yeah. like get away from the drinks get away yeah. from the whatever distance yourself see the town yeah see the town man I mean that's how I've most of the um, countries that we've been to in cities it's like we've played Lithuania and we played Latvia and in <laughs> New Zealand and uh, Lebanon Amazing. Lebanon Croatia you know uh, Tunisia places yeah. that we can't even as Americans travel right now because of ISIS we've played them and uh, we were <clears throat> excuse me we we try to Anthony Bourdain our asses off when we're in those cities <laughs> you know the first tour you're just kind of shell-shocked but by album two you're ready to go. We're going back in these yeah. cities going, wait a minute, we're in freaking New Zealand. They just did Lord of the Rings here. Like, <laughs> let's go see this. You know, we're That's in cool. we're in Moscow. You know, let's get a hotel room overlooking Red Square and then let's go have blintzes and, and drink vodka and let's, t- you know, take the train to St. Petersburg. I mean, so we, we, we genuinely live it up. So it, it was like opportunity matched with resources financially. You yes. Can be, have fun. Yeah. But they, you can do it right. I will say this, and any, any, anybody that's in a band who would happen to hear this interview yeah. could relate to this, you... Your enjoyment of touring um, parallels your ability to afford nicer hotels. So the nice, the better <laughs> one incentive to write better songs. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to make, if you want to tie it to some quantifiable like quotient. Yeah. One big motivator. If you want to write better, write better songs, which equals a better better album which equals a better tour. Yeah. The better tour equals better hotels. That's it. Which honestly equals like you know saves your life it makes you want to keep touring because yeah. the whole first three years of touring for us we were just like oh god Torture. you know <laughs> oh i mean we yeah. found it we ended up in a hotel in in like siberia somewhere where yeah. it i mean it was you know one of our options for breakfast one of the three options was warm yogurt <laughs> Ew. That's, that's awful. <laughs> I was like, thank you. A giant tub of just <laughs> yeah. warm you. No, I'm not joking. The... We walk. We walk downstairs, and it's like four or five vats Jeez. of just room temperature Russian yogurt. <laughs> and then I, I mean, you know, we just, <laughs> it's like gruel. I pour. Uh. I pour myself a bowl. I go. What's the? What is the most? Um, what is the safest thing in this room? Oh, cornflakes. Wow. Okay. I pour myself a bowl of cornflakes. This is true. I pour, well, we walk in the hotel. The first thing sitting on the, on the desk of this hotel in, in Siberia is a pamphlet and you pick it up. Interesting things about it in I mean, the first thing is, <laughs> the first thing is call girls. What? It's like, here's, here's Nadia. Here's <laughs> Rominsky. Here's, you know, Jessica. And, um, <laughs> you know, 35 rubles. And, <laughs> And so we go through this going, okay, Temptation Island, you know, yeah. push, push that away. Um, and we go downstairs for breakfast. I pour myself a bowl of cornflakes because thinking I dodged the bullet only to discover that the milk has been sitting out since like 5 a.m. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, I mean, we've, we've had some, we've had some experiences sharing rooms and sharing bathrooms all over. And we've done the, the, the we did the van thing for a little bit. We've done the, Everybody on one tour bus, including the crew, for years. But we haven't done call girls. <laughs> we have not done call girls. No. I think maybe somebody in our, in our crew definitely did at some point. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, we have not done. We have we have definitely not done call girls. Is there a part of you that is surprised that One Republic is not just still going, but I mean, y- you can say that like you're about to reach like not a peak, but you're still on your way up. Yeah, we've we've had a very gradual climb as a band. Um, I had a long talk with Brandon Flowers about this, like probably three months ago. And the killers, you know, to have your first album be that explosive. Yeah. He's like, you know, if I could have planned it differently, I would have planned it to have been a slower arc. 
like to to you know go yeah. constantly be going uh, always up, always up, starting, and it's 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 so hard uh, if your first album. For us, the bullet that we dodged um, was apologize. Apologize was way too big, way too fast, and yeah. it didn't sound like us. So that you know, the first time we got on a plane and did did any promotional tour, uh, we went to Germany. This is like two months after the song came out. It was mm-hmm. number one in every country in the world. And it's a remix. I mean, nobody in our band is beatboxing, you know what I mean, Uh, live. So we get there, and to give you an example, we have the biggest... I'm sitting here thinking, we're going to be playing arenas like in in a year. This is amazing. Like, you know, uh, we get to the radio station, and the DJ goes, oh, hello. Oh, my goodness. Five of you, and you're white. (laughs) And I thought you were—I thought you were a one of Timberland's solo male black uh, urban R&B artists. This is crazy. And that was literally—I mean, my jaw hit the floor. This lady staring at me, going, "I thought you were a solo artist and Jeez. that you were black." And I was just like, "What?" Like in my whole band, of course, it's like, you know, they're like, "Oh, so we don't exist." And we had a couple interviews like that. That's wow. so disrespect match with like dude, just I'm, kind of nonsense. I'm just—I'm just saying that a a, a a hit record can That's, can be the worst thing if it's not the right kind of record. And, and it sets pressure, too. <clears throat> yeah, it does. You have a bar to hit. We had a bar. Fortunately, um, you know, we shifted from that record to Stop and Stare, which became also another big hit for us everywhere and that's the only reason we're still a band like if that if our second single had not connected i don't know if we would have made another album because i told the band i was like i will not be on vh1 where are they now like I, i refuse to be on that show ever um you know and and if if this is the only thing that we have as for all the years i've been writing and and we've been a band if if all we have is one record one song then let's just chalk it up to a fun year and a half and call it a day. Peace. And so the, the most important record in the history of, our, of this band was Stop and Stare because it's the reason we stayed together as a band. Wow. And um, we avoided the the one-hit wonder. I was like, I, I, that term, one-hit wonder, scared the shite out of me. Yeah. And so then, uh, yeah, <laughs> bums, dude. We're, still, we're, still, we're still on a, I don't know how, but yeah. we're still on the upward trajectory. Like we have definitely not peaked as a band. We're not... Um, I I have a feeling where this can go, and I'm I'm gonna stay the course until it gets there. Amazing, yeah, amazing, amazing. Wow, yeah. This has been a really incredible conversation. Thank you. And I think it's been laced <laughs> with a lot of like really incredible information for the next generation of musicians. Yes, seriously. R- <laughs> write your butt offs, young millennials of the of planet Earth. What do you think? Like, you look at our wall over there. That represents most of radio today. Yeah, from Justin Bieber to Ariana and Megan Trainer. Yeah. What do you think of the next generation of pop music? Um, you mean past them, I mean, or do you mean them and those? them and oh, then past. them and then past them? Um, I think that it's. I've been asked that question before, and I've never had less of a clue as to what it's going to sound like because um, when you look at the arc of technology and music making, all right. So when we started as a band, yeah, I was one of, um, I was one of maybe, I don't know a small handful of people that had a mobile recording rig in it. And I had the most blown out laptop known to man. I put all my money into it and I could still only do like, I don't know, 32 tracks or something. It was still very archaic and slow. And, but that's all I could afford. I couldn't afford to rent out studios. So we made our own records. I did my own demos because I had the gear. Um, having worked with Timberland, I had saved up some money and like got the gear. And, um, so we we had an advantage, yeah. like in all the other bands are, uh, and artists I knew were like waiting and praying for studio time, right? And you were dependent on that. The f- that alone was a gatekeeper. Yeah. So lack of resources, lack of recording ability, that was the primary gatekeeper that that kept out so many um, artists. With computer technology being what it is, and all the recording software on Doesn't on exist. MacBooks, um, there is no more gatekeeper. So technology and money, it no longer prevents people from making music. So a person that literally would have chosen to be a school teacher yeah. or uh, pers- pursue marine biology is now on YouTube uploading videos of themselves covering Justin Bieber or One Republic or Megan yeah. Trainor, and that For changes. Good or bad. It. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I know that you have two things that could happen. <clears throat> One, you have an exponential amount of music. That doesn't mean the quality goes up, but you have you have the world acting as like crowdsourced critics, yeah. right? And cream will always rise to the top. So it doesn't matter. 
You know, it doesn't matter really how many songs get that get out there. I mentioned James Bay earlier. Mm-hmm. A dude with that voice, with that song, does he have more songs beyond that? I hope so. Yeah. Uh, I, I probably does. But that voice. Hosier, same deal. The moment I heard him sing, I was like, well, that guy has a career the rest of, as long as he lives. He'd cut through no matter what. As long as that dude, Hosier could, could literally like write, <clears throat> could write a theme song for like purified water <laughs> and, and somehow you're going to want to hear it because yeah. his voice is so ridiculous. So certain artists, if you have, a, if you have enough of a badass voice, you're, you're fine, right? Yeah. If you have the, that, that kind of investable quality. The danger is when you're just it, it, the danger of of all the music that's out right now and YouTube is things turning kind of milk toast. My my only fear is that uh, is that there could be a, a period where kind of maybe mediocrity gets disguised as like greatness yeah. because things start to get homogenized or just everything kind of starts to sound like each other. That's the downside to everything being accessible all the time is that everything bleeds into everything else. Yeah. So imagine if you have a restaurant, like if you have a buffet, right? If mm-hmm. radio is a buffet and you have nine dishes on one side, nine on the other. Now imagine all those pans have holes that lead to each other. At some yeah. point you go, wait, the turkey tastes like the meatloaf tastes like the, the, the ice cream it. sundae. So that, that's the only, that's the downside of what could happen. Yeah. The, the upside to, the, of the upside of where we're at musically in the next generation is that because you now have, I don't know, I think half the world, 3.5 billion people are online. <laughs> that's crazy. You have, I think that's right. Yeah. You now have, I love the idea that some kid in Bangalore, India, if he has the right song or the right, the right voice, can connect with the entire world. There's no more gatekeepers. Amen. Lord, New Zealand. I yeah. mean, come on. From like some small town in New Zealand, and the, the biggest thing they'd had since before Lord was how bizarre, you know, yeah. how bizarre, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And and so the idea that any kid in a desert community yeah. with no money, if they have what it takes musically, can connect that to me outweighs any negative. That's. But do you Amen. even think that people need a good voice to be successful singers anymore? Because you watch these award shows and you're like, whoa, you are not you, good. You kind of suck. Yeah, <laughs> you're not the best. If I'm being honest. Uh, yeah. Oh man, yeah, maybe off <laughs> off off microphone. I can I can tell you some of the stories, but the um, yeah, there is a look. There, there is a there are still artists again, the Adele's of the world, um, and the the Hosers that that yeah. could sing anything and it make it sound good. Um, I will say I, I saw Stevie Wonder live. Um, you know I'm going to be working with him soon, and I. I was t- on the phone with him last week telling him about the concert I saw with him. Ed Sheeran came up and did a song with him. Yeah. And I performed with Pharrell at the Stevie Wonder Tribute at the Grammys last year. Uh, and he's, I worship him. He's, he's a freak of nature musician. Now he's before my time. Yeah. Like, and, like, and I'm, I, you know, I'm like the age that straddles, according to Google, I straddle millennial. I'm like the old end of the yeah. millennial and the young end of millennial and Gen X. Gen, Gen X. Yeah. Or Gen Y. Is it Gen Y? I think it's Y. It's Y. It y? It's Y. Because yeah. Gen X is like, Ethan Hawke, who's like okay. 50 or something. Okay. Um, so, yeah, not that that's so old. We're all going to be there one day. Um, <laughs> soon. Uh, right soon. Now. Sooner than I want. Uh, but, but so the Stevie Wonder, like, um, precedes m- my generation, yeah. right, in terms of music output. But I grew up listening to his records. Um, when you, I'll just say this, go to a Stevie Wonder concert, and I'm not, throw, I'm not throwing shade at anybody uh, in the current generation, because uh-huh. technically I'd be throwing shade at myself if, 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 with what I'm about to that's say. That's correct. Guys like Stevie Wonder, The Beatles, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, oh my God, Peter Gabriel, The Police. I mean, Sting is a freak of nature musician. Yeah. I, go watch a Stevie Wonder concert, and then and then compare it the musicianship to any artist alive right now that's that's in the modern that's on your playlist. You can't match. None of us come close. No. None of us come freaking close at all. That era of artists before Pro Tools, before you could get in with a computer and a DJ and edit your vocals for two days to make every note flawless. Before that, the the only downside to where music's at today, and for all us millennials, uh, (laughs) you just got to go back and listen to some older records. There is there is a certain level of humanity that modern music does not have. Every now and then, it creeps through. James Bay is an example. That's why when I say humanity, The humanity of that record and his vocal and it, the simplicity. That's it. That's a dude with a guitar writing a ridiculous record who, who can sing it without auto-tune. Simple yet deep, you know? Simple yet deep. Those records will always yeah. cut through. Those are the ones, frankly, that I think probably take home the most Grammys yeah. at the end of the day. Not that that's why you write records. But the musicianship now, you don't have to play a dang thing. If you have a laptop, you can make a hit record. So it... 
the question is, and this is more like a philosophical question, is that a good thing? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I think we're just, uh, we as a society need to redefine what we think an artist I know. is. I know. We have to redefine it. And, and you have to, because that, con- that Stevie Wonder concert, he played the whole album, Songs, songs in the Key of Life, that completely effed me in the head. It, I was like, oh God. It'll change you forever. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, we all, we all kind of suck. Like, right? Look at yourself. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm very yeah. objective. So I look back to myself and I was like, I'm going to up my game. That's like it. I can, I can sing, I can play a bunch of instruments, but I, I'm not near as good as him. So I need to, I need to get better. I'm going to start on this next tour, literally go back to practicing guitar and piano back, to, you know, get my chops back up to what they should be. Amazing. Because I saw him and I was like, and this is no offense to all the DJs of the world, but the DJ dance music phenomenon has, I'm not saying they're not musicians, but it, it, it has definitely um, helped nullify the need for great musicianship yes. because all, when you have a computer and editing software, I can make the intern in the other room like sound like a badass <laughs> with, with enough time because I, I have the software to do it. And that's, that's kind of not good. It's scary. It's scary. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, at the end of the day, you still have to have a killer melody yeah. and a killer, killer and lyric. a great song. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter, how, it doesn't matter how much help you're getting from computers or from editing or from... Um, any modern technology, if you don't have a great melody and a great lyric, uh, it doesn't matter. And chances are there's like, the way I think about it is like there's an artist behind the artist. There is. You know? Yeah. There there is, there is, there's a younger version of Ryan Tedder who wrote that song that you heard. You For know what sure. I mean? There's I've, different artists. That I've already had a couple artists approach me at like some of the radio events where they're like, uh, you know, I, the first song I ever covered was was this. I mean, Bieber, I think the first song that, that one of, if not the first, one of the very first songs he ever covered that blew him up on YouTube was Apologize. I mean, it's the first thing he yeah. told me when he when I met him. He was like, dude, Apologize, man. That was my first, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, there you go. You know, I mean, he's... That's pretty he, cool. He might be definitively the first YouTube star. I mean, we were MySpace. So, That's, like, we, <laughs> we, like, it was us. And then there's a whole generation before us. Fall Out Boy. Where were they? Dude, all right, so check it out. The chronology goes, it goes... In terms of artists that broke on the internet, uh-huh. we, we were in like round two. Round yeah, 2004, 2005. 2000, 2000, actually 2006, 2007. Okay, a little yeah. later. 2006, 2007. Um, we were the n- top unsigned artist on the internet yeah. in 2006. So before MySpace, the first real music site that everybody signed up for went to was called Pure Volume. <laughs> Do you remember oh, Pure yeah. Volume? Yeah, and the, the yeah, concert yeah, tour yeah, updates. Yeah, and yeah man. So artists that got, that, that, <laughs> that got signed or blew yeah. up that, that literally their profile started with pure volume they got discovered up pure volume was my chemical romance wow fallout boy the fray like <sighs> like there were there was there's a whole round of bands yeah, that bred a whole that, generation that of music started before us yeah. um a fall boy's been a band like six years longer than us which i don't even understand that yeah, crazy. um yeah I, I mean coldplay's been a band for 20 years yeah like, come on <laughs> like i was like in i don't know i was in high school i think they were in college when i was in high school or something like that and they i remember when that when that first stuff came out but um uh, so when those then okay. on on MySpace it was us, um, uh, Colby. I knew Colby Calais. She used to hang out in the yeah. studio where we recorded. That's and cool. my buddy who crashed on our couch co-wrote that first hit. She had bubbly. bubbly. Yeah, and that changes and his life forever. He co-wrote a bunch of her of her hits. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and I ended up doing one song for her like years later. Uh, but the, the MySpace was us, Colby, and like a, a two or three other acts that uh. blew up off of MySpace. And then flash forward, it went Facebook, SoundCloud, That's and it. now it's pretty much YouTube. 2010 was like Justin Bieber and YouTube. Yeah. 2008, no, a little bit earlier. 2008, 2009? 2008, 2009. So it's weird because like we had apologize up on on MySpace. In 06, we posted. Yeah. I remember, I can tell you the day we posted it. Right. Um, it's weird because we got dropped by Columbia. And then that day, I was like, oh, FM, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take all our music and just put it online. And that was literally the, the oh, moment yeah. I did it. It changed our career. That's awesome. I put it online and MySpace, the world decided that they liked Apologize because the label didn't like it enough and stop and stare. And so we put that up and we climbed the chart like every day we were climbing the chart till it hit number one. And then that's when all the, the record deal offers came in. Yeah. Um, and then before us was Colby. Uh, and then I, for, I forget who was after us, but there's another big artist now that was right after us. Is it, I think Mike Posner was up there too. He was. Yeah, yeah. Drug dealer girl, his first stuff right yep, out of his yep, dorm room. Right out of Duke. When you look at that, like th- that graduating class almost, it feels nice. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting company to be in. It's fun. I mean, uh, you know, the internet 
the internet for sure changed our career. You know, yeah. it's the reason we're still a band, to be honest. If if the my if MySpace did not exist when we got dropped, uh, we would have stayed Nothing. dropped, and I wouldn't have. I, I didn't have it in me to give it another go. I was very democratic about it and fatalistic. I was like, you know what? I think. I mean, I remember telling my my wife if if apologize. Is if that isn't a hit record, I picked the wrong line of work. Yeah. I I should I don't deserve to be a songwriter. That's literally what I told her. I was like, because if that's not, then I don't know what I'm doing, and I need to pick. I need to be real, and go into something else, like you know, hairstyling. <laughs> that could have been great. That could have been great. Yeah, no, we I know. needed you here. Yeah, I know. I did. <laughs> yeah, where 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 was I in uh. 2007 in L.A.? Um, but yeah, so for me, that the internet kind of saved me, and so so I can't I can't turn around and say well. Because the internet now, it's music isn't going to be as good because it, it's what helped me get yeah. where, where I am. And it's um, giving you talent. It's giving people, like you said, I mean, it's giving people access who have never had access before. Yeah, yeah. Or the tools to create. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the access. The part that I, the part that concerns me that I've seen with a handful of YouTube stars is to go from a dorm room to record deal to now we're making a $600,000 album That's because, it. because you have a hundred million views on YouTube. Yeah. That is false logic. You, you, you've done, you haven't done a show. Yeah. Like you literally have mm-hmm. your stage presence sucks because you don't, you, you haven't been on stage. I mean, it took, it took us years. It took me, it took me a solid four years to actually feel confident on stage to, to the point that I do now, it, you know. And in these situations, you're taking kids maybe within six months mm-hmm. being thrown into something that they're not even prepared yeah. for on numerous different levels. There's, you know, we won't go naming the names, but no. we could rattle off two or three acts right now that were the YouTube stars that if I said to the name right now, you go, oh my God, that's right. Where have they been? Yeah. And it's like, well, I'll tell you where they've been. You know chilling I mean? somewhere chilling <laughs> Zach, Zach and I saw a YouTube concert he took me to one and I said this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life yeah it looked like you took a bunch of random high scores threw them on stage and said do something it's it's a talent show yeah and that, the thing is and, and they, they would have lost there's something about YouTube and I, and I will say this is the only thing I don't understand about YouTube it breeds a certain kind of singer and um, I'm not again. I'm not. I'm not throwing this shade. I'm not saying all people off YouTube because B- Bieber can sing his ass off. He's yeah. amazing. There's a lot of good singers, you know, uh, off of YouTube. Megan Trainer has a phenomenal voice. Ariana. Ariana has uh. a f- ridiculous voice. So I, I'm not applying this to everybody. I'm saying that there is a <clears throat> decent amount of singers. Like I can spot it on radio. Like I can. Uh, like I'm about a year and a half ago. I remember I was I was driving and a record came on uh, I think it was on, uh, on Kiss and came on on air and I was like who is that like I was listening to the song the song was okay but I was like I was with someone in the car I was like that 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 dude literally sounds like a YouTube singer and like un- fill in the blank unidentified homogenized YouTube singer and I googled the song after I, after I pulled over and it was and it was exactly that it yeah. was literally I could hear YouTube on the voice and I can't explain it other than to say. It, it homogenizes it, the soul. Yeah. And like there's a, there's a certain grit and a certain like character that I don't that I wish I heard more on some of the singers. Maybe because they're coming from covers usually. That's why it, it's very karaoke. Yeah. There's, there's a very yeah. clean like in you so many. Yes. you know. So like there's this very like saccharine <laughs> kind of vibe. But to you it. don't feel it. I don't feel it. I don't feel emotionally. Yeah. I don't feel it emotionally. I and get that. You it's more have, emulating than anything. It else, is. I think. You can have all the followers on earth, yeah. but matter. it doesn't matter. Like I don't. I don't. If I don't believe you, you know. And clearly, clearly though. So for a younger, like a super young uh, crowd, like if you're talking girls, like, you know, 11 to 14, yeah. I don't know that they're listening with the same set of, they're not sitting around going, I don't believe him. You know, they're going, he's, <laughs> cute. he's adorable. yeah, he's adorable. He's adorable. <laughs> and, and every single word is like, he's wrote it for me, even though he yeah. didn't write it, you know? <laughs> and, and so that's fine. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not going to be the old, the, the old, you know, crotchety dude. that's like. Oh, that sucks. You suck. You know, I'm just, I'm just t- say, saying my opinion. There's a certain, no. certain YouTube sheen that that lands on a lot of cover artists. But it's completely accurate, and you yeah. see them come and go real quick. You see them come and go real quick. Yeah, and that's the danger in covers. You yeah. got, you got to find, you got to write your own story. 
Yeah. Um, you, you have to, you have to write your own story. It's like, st- spend less time covering artists, spend more time writing songs. That's it. Yeah. Well, study the songs. Study don't, the songs. Don't cover them. Study. Were you guys annoyed at all when One Direction came around and got so successful? Because I was typing you guys in it. It was like yes, One Direction, One I Direction. I was yes. like, where's One Republic? They are nowhere to be found. <laughs> I was a little annoyed. And I found, I met, I met those dudes. Um, I got to know, I got to know some of them, uh, somewhat, some of these. I got to know Harry fairly, uh, fairly well and still see him, you know, uh, Reasonably often, he's making music. Yeah, he's making music. I don't know what for. I, d- I know he's acting right now. He just signed an eighty million dollar Columbia Records deal. Well, there you go. That's boom. A lot of money. That's to pay a lot back. of money. Yeah. Well, those those numbers are always um, fudged. Always, always completely inaccurate as to what actually happens. Yeah. Like an eighty million dollar deal. Uh, even something like that, the way the money breaks down, the way the terms break down, he never gets it. Yeah. Well, it's not that he never gets it. It's that. It's that. That that money could could literally include the entire marketing budget. Yes. Could include tour support for all you know. If it's Staffing. a three sixty deal, could include sta- it. Literally, out of eighty million dollars, an artist could legitimately end up with eight. Yeah, could it could end up with eight? It's like running ten, a business. Ten percent. Yeah, yeah. That's just the way it works. Um, those numbers are, are always misleading. Um, and then you have commissions and attorneys yeah. and business managers, etc. But um, regardless. Uh, yeah, he's a really good dude. I met those guys w- right after they formed in Westwood. I remember I was uh, at the W. I got brought in. I just, I, we had just done our. First, we were making our second album. I had apologized, bleeding love, and right at that that time, I had a, I had a Beyonce record and a Kelly. I had a bunch of records coming out at the same time, and um, I went to the meeting in Westwood uh, and, and met those guys, and they um had the first they all had copies of the first album and were yeah. fan they knew like the the deep cuts That's so awesome. i didn't assume that they got their inspiration or their name at all from us <laughs> but I, I will say that yes it was it was i'd be lying if i didn't say it was annoying uh, only because um when you've been a band as long as we have yeah. and have had you know we're not the biggest band on earth but we've we've done okay <laughs> and you go into uh, meetings, DJs, you know, not all the time, but fairly often would have a, like a Freudian slip because they had just interviewed One Direction. So we got the guy, we got Ryan Tedder from One Direction oh. coming in in five minutes. <laughs> I, oh. I'm about you got to be, come on, dude. What? <laughs> that's what's wrong with it. The, the, you know, that's what's wrong with radio, though. That, I know, it's uh, so just like, and you can hear the sheets going, we got, oh. holy cow. So it looks like in 1997, you know, <laughs> you're reading the Wikipedia stats. I get yeah. it. You know, you got, it's a revolving door, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it, it's not cool. I couldn't help but cringe. Yeah, yeah. The times. And it's not because I'm like, oh, they suck. It's like, no, we have been you around longer. First. And yeah, we had, <laughs> we, we own the word one in perpetuity. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the reality is we were called Republic for like three years. Like when we started, it's just like a garage band yeah. and we were playing around, kicking around LA. We were Republic the whole time. Even, even, I mean, up until we were signed, like, weren't you beautiful mess before that? Though? <laughs> no, th- th- there was a there was a <laughs> no. there was a band there was a band in high school that Zach and I and, my, and Zach's in the band now. We formed a band that lasted all of two months. We formed okay. it to play in a talent show. Cool, like that's literally, and I was the drummer. <laughs> so like yeah. that somehow the most random. Sh- ends up on on wikipedia and i can't take it down like um <laughs> you're editing your own no, wikipedia i've, done, page I've tried it night. probably half a dozen times i've given up i haven't been on my page or our wonder public page in probably two or three years wow because um they had they had the they have the timeline of everything wrong so anyone <laughs> out there listening who is messing with our wikipedia please stop um uh, the timeline of when events happened, of when we started as a band, mm-hmm. like someone was like, so you've been, a, I did a, an interview last week and the DJ was like, uh, you, you guys have been a band for 13 years. That's incredible. And I was like, no, no, no. we've been a band for nine years. He's like, oh, 13. I was like, <laughs> no, uh, nine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> well, it says here, you know, I'm like, One no. One of the pages says that, I think. I know, the page, it says that, and I was like, well, you need to correct your Wikipedia. I was like, yeah. I've tried. It also says I'm five foot nine. That's, is it lying? So or? For, for uh, well, you didn't really see me walking, but for, no. I'm six feet. I've been six feet since I was a senior in high school, oh. and it's like, it's <laughs> like five, and you know, when you're a guy. That's a big that's deal. That's a big deal. Yeah. It sucks. Don't shave uh, three inches off my height. That's not fair. I'll take three inches off of you. No. <laughs> I can't afford I, that. And I won't say where. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ryan Tedder, wherever I go, phenomenal conversation. Thank you. I've learned a tremendous amount. Well, it's all the weed. I just keep talking. I've, got, <laughs> I've gotten to know you. Is, is it hot in here? No. Are you sure? I'm okay. I have an I have an iced cold brew right here. The temperature is fickle. It really, we can never get it right. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's... Uh, 
I don't actually, take I have off one thing to thank you for. Whoa. In the new music video, yeah. you actually thought about the advertising. You didn't just put a Beats pill right in my face. <laughs> you made the Budweiser poster cool. Yes. You put yeah. yourself in. I was like, finally, somebody <laughs> not just shoving a car and be like, hey, Ford, focus. Yeah, I grabbed I, I grabbed a um, uh, Budweiser. We did a big partnership with Budweiser surrounding the Olympics and all that coming out. We have a whole mess of advertising commercials starting in like two weeks, I think, two or three weeks. Um and part of the deal was with this video, and it was not a cheap video, so they helped out. And I, we could not figure out a realistic way to get Budweiser into the video. And Budweiser in Korea isn't even sold as Budweiser, from my understanding. And that's where this video takes place. So um, I get online, and I'm, I, the, the director was like, can you think of any moment in the video where we could put a can? I was like, no. There's no, there's no real moment. I was like, wait a minute. There's a subway scene. What do subways have? Posters, advertising posters. And it's the whole video is kind of early uh, 1980s kind of dress and all that. And I thought, let's find a vintage. So I, I was on, on the phone with Joseph Kahn with the director, and I Google vintage 1980s Budweiser poster. Uh-huh. And the third one I found is the one that's in the, in the video. I took a screen grab, sent it to the Budweiser people, and they're like, we love this. Is amazing, and it was the most. I mean, we 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 were very intentional with everything yeah. in in that video. But advertisement annoys me to no end. It's the worst. It ruins music videos. You see, like a Fergie video, and all of a sudden, there's a close up. <clears throat> excuse me, of like a Mac makeup product. <laughs> and you're like, you're like Mac eyeliner. What you know? Yeah, it's all about strategy. <clears throat> it's all about strategy, guys. The thing you got to keep, keep <laughs> got to keep that in mind. Oh, Ryan Tedder, dude, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, thank you. You are amazing. Seriously, thank you for thank you for the conversation. Learned a lot. Anything else on anybody else's brain? If you had to choose writing and producing or one republic, which one would you choose? Oh God, you really <laughs> ask the hardest. You got to bring it, bust out the big guns. Um, writing, producing versus one republic. I think it's inevitable that at some point I'm not going to want to get on another plane. Yeah. To trudge around the world. So the easy answer is that long-term writing and producing is probably better for your health and like your family and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but One Republic is, n- we have not gotten where we wanted to go. We're almost there. And I want us to get to, a, I think we can be an evergreen band and I know we put on a hell of a show. So I'm not, not done at all with that. But that's that's my very convoluted answer. That's awesome. I'll accept it. I can't pick. <laughs> I can't pick. Life life eventually will choose for me. If we if we if we, you know, come up with aces uh, on the next couple albums, then we'll probably tour until we're until it's not fun. I like traveling though. So if I wasn't doing what I'm doing in the band, I would probably have already approached the Travel Channel or Food Network to do some sort of younger uh. millennial. <laughs> we keep throwing that term around. Guys, yeah, a bunch of millennials hanging out. Um, you know, a millennial Anthony Bourdain yeah. show. That, something like that would be a blast. Um, so I'd, I'd probably still be trekking around. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. Ryan Tedder, man. Thank you so much. And I, from a fan perspective, from an industry perspective, I thank you. Thanks for being awesome. And for sure, man. Thanks for creating music, dude. It means yeah. a lot. Likewise. Thank thanks. you. Thank cool. you. Cool. I'm tall, so I'll go up here. You're only 5'9". I'm only 5'9". How am I reaching six and a half, seven feet? <laughs> it's a bit congested, but I... All right. Gorgeous. Boom. <laughs> 